We would like to thank our sponsors, American Green Incorporated and Indo Expo Trade Show, which will be held in Denver, Colorado, November 15th through the 16th. The website address is www.indoexpoco.com. Again, www.indoexpoco.com. Our speaker today is Chet Billingsley, CEO and Chairman of Mentor Capital. And now I will turn the presentation over to you, Chet. Put that on, and once I click OK, you're going to start talking. Ready, set. You can talk. Hello, this is Chet Billingsley. Yes, we can hear you, Chet. All right. So Metter Capital has been involved in the in the cannabis business since um, November of 2013. I'm uh, not from the cannabis sector uh, originally myself. I have sort of a classic um, investment banking background. I uh, undergraduate years were at West Point. Matter of fact, I'm going back to the class reunion in the, in a few days uh, to couch things. Uh, General Petraeus will be there. We, we call them peaches. Um, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is one of my uh, uh, one of my classmates. Then, then I went on to um, Harvard, did some extra work at MIT studying difficult to treat cancers and did some work over at Harvard Business School. Got an advanced degree at uh, Harvard University and went on to General Electric. I mentioned a little extra on the academic things because I've always sort of been a scientifically based acad acad uh, academic uh, wonk and started my business in, in Silicon Valley and concentrated in, in the cancer field uh, for the last several years. But the uh, current administration stopped the uh, reimbursement in the leading edge cancer cures. So we were looking for something else to do and somebody said, well, gee, would you consider a uh, investment in a marijuana related um, cancer treatment. So that, that's all consistent with the, the history of the company. Um, uh, we've been at this for a long time, funding companies of all manner and sorts. Started privately in 1985 with $1,000 in Silicon Valley. Uh, took it public in 1995. And then, as I, I said, made that switch to the medical marijuana space in November of 2013. But the question still has to be asked, you know, why marijuana? And this was a very difficult one for me to address personally because I'm a, a conservative fellow, if you can't guess from the, from the picture and asking me to become involved in marijuana was sort of like asking a chicken to go surfing in the ocean. Uh, but the scientist in me overcame the, the Republican in me. And there's three major reasons. Um, and first and foremost for us is the medical benefits. When uh, I was involved heavily in the cancer space, I would be counseling a, a new person every week on how to deal with their disease or to uh, die with dignity, frankly. And soon uh, it becomes apparent that the reality is uh, marijuana is as good as anything in reducing nausea, especially that comes from chemotherapy. And when coupled with the the best other treatments, uh, the best normal medical treatments, it's far and away better. And it can reduce uh, 
um, instances of, of vomiting from 30 times per day to once per day. And that's a tremendous boon for the cancer patients because it keeps up their strength to deal with the disease. It also stimulates the appetite, and everyone knows that uh, uh, anecdotally from the, the munchies that people get. And it suppresses pain, but it suppresses pain in a way that's different from how the opiates generally do. And that pain suppression doesn't slow the heart and slow breathing. That's one of the reasons that it's, um, there isn't marijuana overdoses that lead to death as there is in other diseases. And a, although it wasn't in the cancer space, there is a, a grade boom because of the reduction of seizures. So looking at these medical benefits, we felt, okay, we, we understand the medical side of the world. We can pick out the best medically benefiting companies and make investments in them. So we moved in that direction. At the same time, though, I had to address the, the overlaying question of how about social use? You know, isn't marijuana use a, a bad thing? And, and here we found the, the opposite to actually be, be true. And that's because there's only a certain proportion of people, maybe it's 4% of the population, that will be users to the point of intoxication of the various mix of drugs, including alcohol. And there's a very large substitution effect, as much as 60% based on our uh, field research that, that we've individually conducted on this subject. And instead of using crack, crystal meth, heroin, alcohol, if a person uses uh, marijuana for uh, the, the effect, it's going to be much more benign and gentler on their body. Um, in addition, it reduces the gateway introductions. There isn't really such a thing as gateway drugs. It's more the illegal drug dealer would rather upsell people to a more expensive product or a more gripping product, and they give away free samples. If the um, marijuana user or the cannabis user is steered towards a legal dispensary, the uh, gateway introductions are pretty much uh, eliminated. Overall, in the calculation of the oh, approximately 100,000 deaths that occur from alcohol and uh, other drug use, if there was magically somehow complete legalization tomorrow, of cannabis use throughout the United States, approximately 10,000 lives would be saved per year. That's almost you know, 300 lives every day, uh, a life, life saved every five minutes. Because of that, we felt it was, it was a reduction in harm to go forward in this cannabis space. But of course, we're not here to uh, just be a social benefit to society, although we do steer towards socially beneficial investment. This sector is a, a rising tide, as they say. Um, overall, there's about a, has been about a 26% increase in the marijuana index of, of uh, about 160 companies so far this year. We project that there is, a, we project, or other folks project, a 64% year-over-year increase in cannabis sales. And overall, over the next handful of years, there will be approximately a 20-fold growth in the overall consumption of cannabis and marijuana as there's a shift from illegal to legal use. The usage itself will not increase. It's just a rotation from illegal use into the legal sector. So far this year, uh, Mentor Capital share price is up about 165%. And the, the key reason from an investor standpoint that we're, we're in this sector is to capture that economic growth. And as a company, 
we look to do something that's worthwhile for society medically and decreasing the harm from social use. To, to determine how an investor is going to uh, profit from, from this, uh, I like to think of the investor equation. There's three different main components. A company like ourselves has to be able to raise investment capital. The more investment capital that is raised, where a small portion of that is always passed on indirectly to the existing shareholders, um, the, the more capital that can be raised, the better it is for the existing shareholders. As long as that capital is not, not raised at a discount for the, uh, for the benefit, perhaps, of uh, key insiders, and we don't, that's not something we do at all. That invested capital is, is then run through growing businesses. Here, we probably receive uh, two or three contacts every day, every working day, for someone looking for uh, additional funding. There's plenty of companies out there that are looking to uh, receive growth capital in this growing sector. But the last uh, equation, or the last portion of that equation, is public company fairness. And this is something that is uh, sometimes lacking in many of the public companies uh, across, the, across the board and is a, a danger that the SEC and, and FINRA have warned about in the cannabis sector in particular. And the simple part of that equation is if the company increases sales by 50 percent but doubles the number of shares it has outstanding because a lot of those shares are going to insiders or affiliates, then the result for the, for the normal shareholder is a, uh, they end up with 75% of what they had and the, the insiders uh, will of course benefit from receiving shares and that's something that uh, we don't do. Instead, by looking at all three factors, we generate the maximum shareholder return and we'll cover each of those. In terms of investment capital, a lot of our uh, fundraising is done or is moved now to be, to be done outside of the normal public circles. We look to institutional investors and are arranging to raise um, private investment in public equity. Uh, generally, the institutional investors get an opportunity to invest under our wing in the uh, more or less private cannabis projects that we're involved in and during the time that it's held privately they will uh, receive the lion's share of the benefit. At, at the end of that period when they want to get liquidity they can exchange their shares without any discount that would be dilutive to shareholders for our existing uh, common shares and that way they get liquidity but from that point on the existing shareholders um, participate on a, on a proportional basis in the upside of that particular investment. We do the same thing for accredited private investors and for them we have a preferred share program that uh, raises money um, from them. Now here we're not giving any details of, of, of these programs. We're not looking to solicit for any investment. I uh, just make people aware that there's significant um, fundraising that's going on that is on a, a, almost a private basis. Our own shareholders have warrants that they've had for a, for a number of years and as the share price rises some of those shareholders um, exercise their, their warrants and that gives additional cash, uh, has additional cash to flow into the company. The uh, total amount of, uh, from those warrants will be probably uh, $23 million uh, over time. We invest those funds in the growing businesses and as I said there's a plethora of companies that, uh, that contact us and that we have an opportunity to invest in. 
thus far, it seems like our uh, our track record is um, tapping in at about a 200% uh, gain, and we're quite uh, pleased with that. That was consistent with the uh, the gain we we got in our cancer uh, portfolio, and these are all approximate uh, numbers. Um, uh, Microcannabis has a directory for the in, entire cannabis sector. Nevada Cannabis Ventures is uh, investing in a new hedge fund that's targeted for Nevada. Our return there should be twice the return for the normal hedge funds investor, again, a 200% sort of return. On the public side, of public investments in public cannabis stocks, we find that they're often high priced, and we keep that investment to a minimum. Uh, but our but our leading investment, GWPH, is is doing very well. As I said, this is consistent with how we did in the the cancer can, the remaining cancer portfolio that we have, which is de minimis at at this time, but still is doing well. Our major investment to date was in uh, uh, Bang Corporation. There we financed, uh, including Bang itself, a total of four projects in um, GUM, Bang Financial, and an expansion into Arizona. And uh, we put up about a million and a half dollars over a 60-day period of time. Uh, however, that, uh, uh, as, as the earlier speaker talked about, there's some um, lack of understanding perhaps in in the contract process and uh, we're looking for a new business to rotate that million and a half dollars into. We, we are seeking to retrieve the money from Bain Corporation. Uh, we put up the, the million and a half and uh, this is this has caused a uh, a lawsuit, which uh, which is surprising to me because I've never been involved in any lawsuits like this before, where we issued the money and issued uh, seven and a half million dollars in freely trading shares, and their response was, "We we don't want the freely trading shares, and we're going to keep the million and a half, and uh, and not give Metter Capital." Uh, the stock that was promised. And we're not looking to have a shotgun wedding with anyone, but if someone doesn't want to work with us, then uh, they need to give the million and a half back. So we sued in federal court to um, uh, for rescission to retrieve our funds. The one thing that I can promise uh, any investor is that we will work above and beyond to ensure there is that last component, the investor equation, the public company fairness. And uh, here, even before we became involved in, in trading in the cannabis sector, I put all of my shares in a voluntary escrow. Now, this was not a great sacrifice for me because I had not sold any shares for a decade or so. But if my shares, and I'm the only major controlling person, are in an escrow, then um, it makes no sense and uh, to do a pump and dump because um, I have no ability to dump my shares. I wouldn't do that anyway, but I wanted to make a public statement that we weren't going in that direction. So my shares during the entire time we've been involved in the cannabis sector have always been in an escrow. Further, we don't give any compensating shares to the board or to myself. We don't hire an IR firm to pump up the stock. We don't uh, succumb to vulture financing. We don't uh, really need, we're not desperate for funds, we have plenty of cash. And uh, my salary, uh, because Warren Buffett used to pay himself this, my salary has been $104,000 for 15 years. By taking this approach, we know that as money is invested, put into the growing companies, the result is actually going to go the, 
to the shareholders in a, in a fair proportion and not be siphoned off by uh, insiders or affiliates um, getting shares and the, getting shares at a discount and then selling them. And I think that is a key component of getting a uh, full and fair return to shareholders in this cannabis sector. Because of this approach and our, and our history in the Silicon Valley and in the cancer space, uh, where we were better known as opposed to the, the cannabis space where everybody is relatively new, um, we're contacted to comment on Wall Street Journal articles. We're working now in a Forbes magazine article. Our advertisement is being carried in Southwest Airlines. We have another major national newspaper, you'd all know the name of, I can't say until it's approved, that'll be carrying a, a large ad for us. And of course we're featured in Food and Drink magazine uh, talking about the emerging world of cannabis. And this is the legitimate public acceptance as opposed to say oh, High Times magazine that's, that's already in this uh, area of the economy. We're looking, looking towards um, uh, a NASDAQ listing and then working in that, in that direction. This is a, a major target and we've taken the, the steps to get there, initiated the cannabis trading, had a certification of the board, uh, changed our transfer agent. Uh, importantly, we hired the head of audit, audit operations as our CFO to make sure that our audit could, uh, could go through smoothly. We then up qualified to current information on the, uh, on, the, on the pink sheets. We've now submitted all our financial audit input and uh, as soon as that audit is, is done and it's on its way, we'll um, submit our, our Form 10 and that will be a major step towards the uh, bulletin board and on towards NASDAQ as we gather uh, sufficient assets. One of the things that, that people have, uh, uh, have some concern on is, uh, is a reverse split of the stock. Now, this is, uh, to me, is reprehensible. I'm very opposed to reverse split and we, we don't expect to do that. We're hoping that as we gather assets, we will qualify for NASDAQ without having to do any uh, reverse on the stock to make sure our, hair, our share price is above the $5 mark. Um, the only time a, a reverse split is justified in my mind is uh, say if the stock price is uh, $3 a share and you need to be above $5 to qualify then you do a 2 to 1 reverse split, you change the share symbol and now you're on NASDAQ and almost uh, invariably the share price goes up at that time just because there's more people that can buy the stock. All of these things together have uh, contributed to the uh, increase in the Mentor Capital share price. It is confused somewhat by the cannabis bubble that it occurred in the March time frame. What happened is there was approximately at the beginning of the year 26 legitimate cannabis companies. Today there's probably 96 uh, fully legitimate ones, 160 others if you count newcomers and maybe more than 200. As you go from 26 to 200, there's going to be a, a dilution in the share price. So we started out on uh, January 1st with the legalization in Colorado. There was a great uptick in interest in the, in the cannabis space and we all saw the lines outside of dispensaries in cannabis and everybody started investing but there wasn't sufficient supply of public company stocks to absorb all that investment. So the stock price shot up. In the, in the cannabis uh, index that by uh, 420 investors, the Bazinga in index, it shot up to 1,010. And then as more cannabis companies came online, increasing the supply, the, uh, there was a dilution 
as, uh, as there's more companies to invest into. And that brought the, the share price down where the index is now, I think, 203. So overall, the, the cannabis companies went up and down. They're still up about 26% uh, year to date. And during that time period, Mentor Capital also uh, had an increase and decrease. But the best comparison is looking at where we were on January 1st on a, on a normalized basis with how the other cannabis companies are and where we are today. And you can see that the the general performance of Mentor Capital is significantly better than uh, the, the cannabis index as a whole. Our, our financials at the end of the, the second quarter, and we're now preparing the third quarter financials, um, we had revenue of about a uh, million dollars. Part of this is from the legacy investments, but of course as those are sold off, that cash rotates into the cannabis field. So the, uh, the fact that we have other businesses that will be sold and substituted in doesn't really change the equation in the future because we'll just pick up cannabis businesses in that, uh, in that area. Um, have uh, net income, now all of these would be doubled for an, on an annual basis. Our net income per share for the six months was uh, a couple cents. Um, on the balance sheet side, we've got about uh, a little shy of a million dollars cash, about three million in current assets, um, five million or so in um, total assets, and we're virtually debt free. There is, uh, as in any business, some payables and liabilities the, the non-affiliate debt here is really non-affiliate payables, and we could we could pay that off tomorrow if we if we wish to. And we've got about 14 million shares outstanding, which I would draw people's attention to the fact that uh, a number of other companies might have 400 million or a billion, and by keeping these the number of common shares down, uh, we keep the share shareholder value per share. I'd like to thank you for uh, uh, giving us a look and, and listening during this uh, conversation and happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, thank you, Chet. Uh, give us about 30 seconds and we'll see what questions come in. The first question, Chet, is why did you do a 1,000 to 1 reverse split in 2008? Yes, the, the shareholders voted on that about, um, I think it was 85% of shareholders voted in favor, both on a numeric basis and on a holding basis. Everybody was in favor of that. When we, when we started, the company had about $150,000 and nothing else. And our capital structure was a lot of warrants and a... Uh, and a lot of shares. Everybody that was a shareholder was a warrant holder. And we had warrants in our left pocket and shares in our right pocket. And what we were looking to do is merge with or partially merge with different companies. But nobody wanted to be diluted, say 20 or 30 percent, to merge with us or to merge a portion of their business with us and then receive the cash at a slight discount, maybe a 10% discount, because their overall dilution would be oh, 30 or 40%. So we just couldn't get any, any traction um, with that many shares sitting there with no existing business at the, at the start, you know, at the starting line. So we talked to the, the shareholders and said, uh, the business won't change if we do the thousand to one reverse reverse split, um, we'll have very few shares, but we'll have all of these warrants. And if you had, if you the shareholder had 1% uh, of the business before and 1% of the warrants, then afterwards you'd still have 1% of the shares greatly reduced and 1% of the warrants. And that will make us much more attractive to the 
uh, people we might merge with. And everyone felt that was a, was a good idea. It was sort of, let's, let's do this from, the, from the, the beginning of this phase of the, of the company. And as soon as we did that reverse split, we began to have people that were interested in merging with us or working with us in order to get uh, access to the cash that would be generated from our warrants. So we became a funding vehicle as, just, as opposed to a, uh, a company with a lot of shares but not much inside, inside of it. So it worked, it worked very well and uh, the I think everybody is pleased with the result because all of the shareholders, as I said, were warrant holders and this shifted the value from the shares in the left pocket and loaded it up on the warrants in the right pocket. The next question, if you don't get the 1.5 million back from Bang, uh, how are you going to invest in other companies? Well, as I, as I um, discussed, we're already um, looking to institutional investors, road shows to bring in uh, equity investments, to accredited investors to, to bring in preferred share sales, and, uh, and our shareholders hold a large number of warrants that uh, they could also exercise. So a, as any public company, um, it's relatively easy to raise money as long as you uh, have a good reputation in the, in the capital markets and know what you're doing. I think uh, compared to any of the, of the uh, cannabis companies out there, uh, we probably know this know this business uh, the business of raising money as well or better than any of them and it's uh, just a straightforward exercise it's it's what we do uh, next question um, I, I guess this is an easy question how does an individual invest in mentor well there's two ways to invest. If you are uh, a, um, a, a, a regular person, uh, you can buy our stock through any, any broker. Um, our symbol is M-N-T-R, mentor without the vowels. And um, if you're an accredited investor, well, give us a call and we'll chat with you on, on what we can do. Again, yep. we're, not, we're not soliciting for any investments now. That's just trying to answer the question. Next question. Are you looking for ancillary businesses to invest in to become part of the fund? Yes. Um, we'll look at, at any company in the broad cannabis space. We don't provide management. We leave management firmly in the hands of the existing operator. And uh, we looked for uh, good financials to uh, support our audit. Uh, uh, alternatively, we can handle the, the accounting practices for different firms if they're not very sophisticated in that regard. And anybody that has a good, solid businesses, we're looking at more of the larger businesses. We'd like to make investments in the um, uh, more the million dollar size. And um, if somebody is, is very small, it's hard for us to work with them. If they're larger, it's easier. We especially look like companies that are on the on the edge or considering going public and have enough throw or enough weight to go public in the future because we can bring them in as a public company incubator and uh, provide them with some funding, move them forward, make sure their accounting is uh, proper, uh, get their audits in order and then in many of the in, in in any of the many different ways that they can go public, we can assist in that process by dividending 
our interest in them to our shareholders. And that results in, at the beginning, them having, say, 4,000 shareholders all interested in the cannabis space with additional shares in whatever that new company might be. Is one of them. Check. Yes. Uh, how many warrants did you convert to stock this year? Uh, for, for myself, uh, almost all of my holdings this year, uh, almost all of my holdings period, um, were held in the form of warrants. When we did the, the, um, the, the transaction with Bang Corporation, we were looking to get a loan from a, uh, a foreign private equity group. In order to secure that loan, they asked for the company to put up shares as security. I wasn't willing to do that. I wasn't willing to issue additional shares. Um, so I said, well, I personally could put up my shares as security against the loan. Now, my, my shares were actually in the form of warrants. So the company owed me personally, remember this is over a 29 year period of time this is built up, the company owes me $1.3 million. So from the $1.3 million, I had them loan me $900,000 and use that to exercise 5 million warrants. Then I took all of those warrants and put them alongside my previous shares and lock them in an escrow where they have been and continue to reside. So the answer to the specific question is I exercised five million warrants uh, this year and all of those are in escrow and will remain in escrow. The next question, Chet, is can you discuss the Symbian bank loan issue? Sure. Uh, I did work internationally when I was at General Electric. Uh, put factories in Tokyo, in Ireland, and uh, I worked with the State Department early on when I was at Aerojet with uh, Russian interests in the uh, natural gas field. So very early on, in January of 2013, it was difficult to get classic funding from normal banks. They just weren't touching the cannabis space. And I thought that it might be possible for me to get uh, funding internationally. And a, a, a fellow from uh, Japan, um, now a lot of these guys are, you know, if somebody's involved in the cannabis space, maybe they're not first tier people, and I knew that. But he pointed out to me that people were trying to get money out of the Ukraine before the, the doors closed around, along the border. So um, I understood that dealing with the, the Russians and the, and the Ukrainians are very similar to the Russians except, uh, except probably worse. I talked to a fellow who was on Hillary Clinton's um, tour of the Ukraine and he said they're even bigger thugs than the, the, the Soviet Union or, or bigger thugs than uh, Russia. So I said, well, it's in their, in their interest to get money out of the country. We, we have a good reputation, and if they give us a loan, well, you know, what is the risk for us? Uh, it's not like we're giving them bulldozers first or giving them stock first or anything like that. We're keeping all the stock, all of the mentor capital stock in the U.S. We're not giving them any access to that. And if they give us a loan, great. It, would, it was a $35 million loan, and that probably would have caused the exercise of $100 million in warrants, and we'd be a completely different company now with a share price maybe in the $7 or $8 per share range. So we, we took a shot at it, and the uh, private equity group there um, announced on uh, March 14th that they had uh, closed the loan. Now usually that's quite a good sign, but we were a little bit nervous because at that time the borders were starting to close down around 
the borders of the Ukraine. No, no country wants all the money of their country to flee at that time. So um, they announced it, said it was, it was funds were being wired from their correspond bank, but was never able to actually be wired. So um, we kept the door open. Um, they tried other ways to get the, the money out of the country. They sent it to uh, Luxembourg. Now, the group they sent it to in, in Luxembourg was really just uh, an alter ego of themselves, much like we might reincorporate in Nevada to avoid um, uh, state taxes. It was that type of transaction. But once it was outside of the Ukraine, it was no longer subject to confiscation, uh, potential confiscation by maybe uh, Russian interests that could have taken over, who knew at that time. Uh, they no longer needed us, and after um, a, a total of three months we worked on this, um, I said, you know, if you, if, you don't, if you don't fund, if you can't wire funds, you can't overcome the currency export restrictions, uh, we're going to have to close this opportunity. And uh, they said, you know, we can't, we can't do it. And um, I, they did the press release to start things off. We never announced the loan um, because I don't announce things that aren't real, that, you know, money in hand. And I wish that they would not have done it. Then it would just have been a loan we applied for and it didn't occur. Uh, but because they announced it, it stirred a lot of people up. So I made them announce, made, made them announce that they had closed that particular uh, transaction. Um, and that, that was a, a loan we applied for that, that didn't happen. A lot of work. I remember, remember when we were trying to get that done, I was talking to the, the head of uh, the private equity group. You know, he's in his limo. He's got a deep uh, Russian voice, as you might expect. And uh, uh, we worked to get things done. Uh, I think I slept five nights out of seven nights that, that week trying to uh, make it happen. We, we put up a credit default insurance to secure that. We could have gone to Lloyd's of London. We went to a, uh, an Irish firm. And uh, our total risk there, my analysis was, we were risking half a cent for every dollar that we would have made in the overall transaction. So we could afford it. Uh, we can afford, you know, a half a cent to per dollar. It's not a large amount of risk. Uh, it didn't happen, but uh, we didn't lose any shares. We didn't lose any bulldozers. Uh, all it did is take too much of my time, and the uh, and we're retrieving the the credit default insurance um, using the the largest law firm in Ireland to bring that back. Uh, I think we have a large uh, percentage of, of uh, probability of getting that back uh, because uh, in the past I worked with the fellow that went on to be the Prime Minister of Ireland. So we have very good, very good connections there. Our next question, other than selling stock and redeeming warrants, what provides mentor capital with, with revenue? Well, we're a um, uh, an operating company that invests in different companies. So we've received considerable revenue over time from the, the companies that we've invested in from the beginning of time. And, um, uh, and then the the investments that we've made as we, you know, we invest money in, and then we sell off those investments at a profit, and the the, the profits uh, help fund the operation or fund our stock repurchases or justify the increase in the in the share price. All right. Next question: uh, What happened with the acquisition of HempCon? Did you hear that? Chat? Well, it's yeah, I did. Um, the uh, HempCon was 
my first introduction to what the previous speaker referred to as a, a lack of sophistication in some of the bus businesses in the um, cannabis space in Silicon Valley or in the biotech sector or, or cancer sector, everybody understands the rules of the road. You come out with a letter of intent, the public company does, the parties negotiate um, any final uh, items and then they issue a contract and you know, come out with a letter of intent so there's no leaking of the possibility of a major change and so everybody's on an even foothold and then at the end you close the transaction or if you don't want to close the transaction which is completely possible sometimes there's higher bids and so forth um, then you're quiet during the interim and then at the end you uh, make a single announcement saying that we're not going to go forward. In this case we, we announced as agreed the non-binding letter of intent and almost as soon as we made that announcement other public companies approached HempCon and said that they wish to uh, give them a better deal and immediately HempCon started saying that they had they did not have a relationship with uh, Menor Capital. Now it is true that we had not signed a contract we had signed the we, we had executed a letter of intent so that's not the the normal way that uh, public company transactions should be conducted. Um, after a certain period of time uh, as called for in the in the letter of intent, we we issued a statement or a, a statement to Hemcon and did a press release that said we would not be going forward to conclude the letter of intent by the signing of a, a formal contract. Later, uh, the the head of Hemcon called me again and asked if he could. Uh, receive funding from me at a you know at a later point he maybe got uh, maybe wanted to become funded and found it wasn't so easy to get a better deal than we were already ready offering um, I declined to to work with him uh, Chet, Chet we got time for one more question uh, let me see here uh, one question is how how do you invest one million in new companies uh, if you only have nine hundred thousand in cash? Um, the the investments. Uh, we, we, I, um, I I don't understand the the question exactly, but let me take a shot at it. We try to maintain here a cash reserve of one million dollars, and uh, probably it's uh, more emotional than anything else, but that's just uh, the approach that I, that I try to take. And then as we raise more money, um, the amount above a million dollars, we invest, we look around and invest in the best opportunities that are there. If, uh, if our balance falls to 900,000 or 500,000 or whatever it might be, and then we bring in another two million dollars we would top up our reserve to about a million and then invest the the excess so we're we're continually uh, you know we received a check for investment yesterday and uh, and those funds will be earmarked um, for investment someplace as that those opportunities arise I hope that answers that question Okay, uh, I think that's all we have for the Q&A. Any last comments, Chet? Yes, um, uh, I take our responsibility to the, to the shareholders uh, completely to heart. Uh, Peter Drucker, the, the great management of, uh, philosopher and writer, said, the men and women in business are the stewards of the assets of society. And I feel that the the assets or the investments that the shareholders have given 
given and entrusted to me are a responsibility that I have to apply in an effective way to this, this market. I think we understand the medical side of things better than most anyone. I see that the social side of cannabis uh, use is actually reduces the harm because of that substitution effect. And uh, I make sure that in every single way that the shareholders are treated fairly. And if you want fair treatment, matter capital is a very good place to, to look to. And I, I challenge uh, any other public company to have the, the same sort of protections in place um, as we do to ensure there's not a pump and dump, the extra ex issuing of shares, uh, even the fact that all of my shares are in escrow and, and are not being sold uh, ensures that the shareholders get the absolute fairest treatment they possibly can. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, this is the end of the presentation. We did uh, receive a lot of questions. Uh, so what we'll do is submit those questions to Chet and have him answer those questions. And uh, you can email dawallace at cannawebcast.com for the answers to your questions that did not get answered during the presentation. Thank you, Chet, and we look uh, forward to uh, seeing what Mentor Capital has in store for the future. Thank you.